Hello and welcome to an Aussies Abroad special, The World Game, where we delve into Aussies playing football around the globe from a whole range of different angles. And given it is such a multi-dimensional industry, we've brought together a number of fantastic football minds to provide us different perspectives on Aussies in world football. Our resident expert, Daniel Garb, is going to run us through Australians doing amazing things all over the world. Plus, he's got a few good anecdotes of his own from his own personal Aussies Abroad journey. Socceroos and Brighton goalkeeper Matt Ryan will join us to explore his incredible journey from the suburbs of Sydney to the top tier of world football. And our old friend Andrew Orsardi, the former media commentator with SBS and ESPN, who's these days got a high-ranking position at FIFPro, the Global Players Union, is going to join us from Amsterdam to give us a unique perspective on a global basis, political, the challenges Australian players face when they go overseas, Australian player development, and what's the best path forward there, and the exponential growth in the women's game around the world. So many great things to talk about, lots to get into, so let's get stuck into it. It's our Aussies Abroad football special. Well, when it comes to Aussies Abroad in the football world, one man stands above all others as a font of information and authority. That man is Daniel Garvin. We are absolutely delighted to announce him as our Aussies Abroad football correspondent. Garby, welcome. Thank you very much, Jace. I have dressed appropriately, the yeah. emblem on my hat, and uh, looking forward to talking all things Australian football and, uh, in particular, Aussies abroad over the next little while. Thanks for having me on. You spent eight years overseas as Fox Sports' as European correspondent. In that time, three World Cups, five Premier League seasons, an infinite amount of interviews and catch-ups with Aussies doing things around Europe. Must have been an amazing experience. It was fantastic. I was very fortunate, um, you know, as you were as well. It's it, there's nothing like it. The freedom, but the the opportunities and the experiences that you, you know at the time are, are once in a lifetime moments for you. It, it was incredible, and you know, the first Premier League game until the last, the novelty never wore off. It was awesome all the way through. So enjoyed it. I know a lot of people were jealous, but I appreciated every moment. And people often ask me, you know best interviews you've done, best moments. And I always say, you know, some of the Socceroos games I got to go to and the trips I got to experience are up there with anything. And more than that, you know, the interviews were great with, with superstar Premier League players, but I love chatting to the Aussies abroad and just getting their experiences and, and getting a, an, an insight into the hard work they've had to put in to get to, to where they are, the daily struggles at times, and also the way that they're appreciated by the fans of their club or the managers at their club. That were... That was some of the best stories that I got to do as well. So looking forward to chatting about some of those. Yeah, going to dig deep into your background and great anecdotes a little bit later in the show. You've touched on a point I was going to make. Things are very different when you actually get to go overseas and see it and live it day to day and see what life is like as a professional athlete. It doesn't matter what the sport, does it, Garby? A long way from home, the challenges that are involved in that, it's never quite as glitzy or glamorous as it looks when you sit back here in Australia and just watch it on TV. Oh, most certainly. I mean, I think we're going to talk about Harry Kiel a bit later on when we discuss, uh, you know, Aussie managers making their way in, in Europe and, and around the globe at the moment, which is fantastic. But you know, I remember going to interview Massimo Luongo, who you know, was coming through the ranks as a, as a young Aussie player with promise at Swindon. He'd been up the books at, at Tottenham and had wraps around him. We know he's done great things for the Socceroos since. But I remember going to Swindon to interview him on the day in which he got his first Socceroos call-up. And that reception to go to the training pitch, they gave me and my cameraman Wellington boots, like way past my <laughs> knees, because we had to trample through mud that was just splashing all over my suit to get to the training ground to, to interview Mass. And I got to see, you know, League One games and championship games that, you know, Aussies were playing in. That it was the furthest thing from glamour, the football, the stadium, the weather, everything about it was tough. And, uh, you know, people don't always appreciate what some of our boys are going through over there and now our girls mm -hmm. and how tough it is to, uh, to make it. And some of them have come through, but some of the stories along the way are interesting as well. So let's start with a bit of an overview about where Australian football overseas around the world is at right now, because we've got probably more players in total across the men's and women's game playing around the globe than ever before. And the women's side, it's never been healthier. And we'll dig deep into the women's side a little bit later. But let's start on the men's side of the game. Big numbers, but not as many in the top leagues as they used to be in the golden generation. It's not just about talent, though, is it? There's other factors involved here. Yeah, there are massive factors involved. Look, talent is a big part of it. There's no doubt that our production and our development has dropped off and the quality has, 
has dropped off. We've got one Aussie in the Premier League as it stands going into the season in Matt Ryan and none that will be playing in La Liga or Serie A uh, or the first team in, in the Bundesliga going into the upcoming season. And, and that's a shame. It's a far cry from our glory days, of course. But, you know, in terms of the Premier League, which is a league that a lot of people measure us up on compared to, say, the golden generation when we had Kuhl and Maduka and Cahill and Schwarzer and Neil and Emerton and so on and so forth. It's so hard to make it. It really is. I mean, when all those Aussies were coming through, and I'm not saying they wouldn't have progressed no matter what, they, they would have. But to get that opportunity, it was, it was far easier then because, you know, a, a bargain signing in the Premier League in the early 2000s was around a couple million pounds. And they would look at Aussies for bargain signings. You know, Timmy Cahill came through Millwall. The same with Kevin Musket. Mark Schwarzer came from Bradford. Brett Emerton was signed for cheap from, from Holland and so on and so forth. Nowadays, a bargain signing in the Premier League is like 10 to 15 million pounds. For a top six club, it's like 25 million pounds. They can find a regular for around that. It's a bargain. And for the smaller clubs, they're looking at 10 million. So that means with that investment, they're scouring the globe. They're just looking everywhere. And it's so much harder for our Aussie boys to get the chance. You know, we had some who were good enough regardless, Kuhl, Bosnich, Baduka, et cetera. Others who may not have been given that opportunity, you know, five and, and earlier. They just may not have been given that chance. They would have excelled in another league, no doubt. Um, and thankfully, they were given the chance because they showed how good they are. But it's just so competitive now. And we have a few that I think could do well in the Premier League if given an opportunity. But it's just not going to be forthcoming like it was 15 years ago. And Garby, we've, as you mentioned, we've got Aussies all over the globe. Um, which ones have really caught your eye? Because I think from what you've just said then, there might be a few uh, player managers out there. You might be able to unearth some gems. Yeah, well, there's, there's a few that are going really well that are important to the Socceroos. I mean, one is Awama Bill, who won the Danish League at the end of this season. That's just been completed, obviously a bit later than expected because of, of COVID. So he goes into uh, the current Danish season with, uh, with Michelin, uh, looking to go back to back. And, and we saw at the Asian Cup how exciting a, a prospect he is for Australian football. So he's one to look at and certainly one that you can see moving to a bigger league. Maybe not the Premier League or whatever, but maybe from Holland to say, uh, sorry, from Denmark to say Belgium or Holland and go up a level, uh, you know, if he has another good season. He's an important one. Martin Boyle's a big player for the Socceroos moving forward. Another big season with the Bernian and uh, he scores a lot of goals. He signed the new contract there. He's got pace. Graham Arnold wants to use him either as a striker or on the wing for the Socceroos regularly. So we'll watch his season with progress. Uh, his progress with uh, with keen interest this season. Adam Taggart, I mean, the striking stocks for the Socceroos are going to be interesting. Jamie McLaren comes off a great campaign, Golden Boot winner in the A-League. Adam Taggart won the Golden Boot in, uh, in South Korea the season before last. Uh, how's he going to go backing it up this time around when the season starts towards the end of this year? Because that jostling for the Socceroos striking role heading into Qatar 2022 is going to be so interesting. So we'll watch Adam Taggart's season. Big Harry Suter, the big Scott, is signed for Stoke in the championship. He's about six foot a million. He is that tall, <laughs> Harry Suter. And a big centre-back like him, if he can do well at Stoke, whereas we know they like the long ball on a cold Tuesday night at Stoke, that will be interesting. So uh, he's one, if he can break through and play regularly for Stoke in the Championship, all of a sudden his stocks rise. And of course, Matt Ryan, the big one. Another season in the Premier League. We can't wait for that. He's flying the flag for our Aussies abroad, most certainly Matty Ryan. And if he has another big campaign then I think the big clubs look at him. You know, there's been talk about a Liverpool and a Man United linked in the past. You know, they're not going to take a punt unless you've had either a ridiculous season, and he's had very good ones, but maybe not an unbelievable, ridiculous season yet. Um, but if he has another very good one, I think a big six, big eight club move is on the, uh, the cards for Matty Ryan. So another big campaign coming up for him. And a bit of a shout out actually to our friends at, uh, at OS Aussies who do a fantastic job on keeping tabs of Australians playing football all around the globe. So if you want to have a look and have a follow, we, we're uh, putting a list together on our own Aussies underscore abroad Twitter feed, but also at OS Aussies who do a great job monitoring and profiling and keeping tabs on all our Aussies playing football around the world, which is almost a full-time job, Garby, as you well know. Now, particularly at this time of the year, transfer windows were open, money's flying around left, right and centre, deals are getting signed and ripped up and cancelled and blokes are re-signing re or walking out the door. 
there's been some Aussies involved in this in the last uh, week or so, quite a few actually. Let's, let's talk through some of those bigger moves and what they mean, because sometimes what they seem and what they yeah. mean can be two different things. Let's start with Aaron Moy, who leaves the Premier League and goes to China. This was the big one, wasn't it? We all woke up on Saturday morning and were shocked when we read that Aaron Moy had moved from the Premier League in Brighton to Shanghai SIPG. And let's be honest, off-Broadway in a football sense to, uh, to China. And, and everyone's immediate reaction, understandably, was to moan and groan and say this is just another setback for Australian football. We've lost one on the big stage and uh, he's taken the cash in China. And you know what? Those feelings are, are completely adequate. And I felt the same way when I first read it. Because... You know, the impact of an Aussie in, on the big stage in the Premier League, as we know so well from you know, the halcyon days that we've just discussed, it is enormous. It has such a big impact on Australian football and the way in which it's perceived. But when you look at this in a bit more detail, you can see where Aaron Moy is coming from. Firstly, he turns 30 this month. The, the money he's been offered is, you know, he's, he's on great money in the Premier League anyway, but it is life-changing cash. I mean, it doubles his salary and you'll never have to work again. And he can set up his family. And when you're 30 years old and that contract gets presented, well, you can understand someone taking it. Brighton also has options in his position. They've just signed Adam Lallana from Liverpool. They've got another couple players coming through. At 30 years of age, he might not get regular football in the Premier League, which means a season being in and out of the team, a contract like that goes away. They look at someone else. So you can see why he'd want to take it now. And also, he's going to a big club in Shanghai SIPG. It's not just, you know, a case which happens with a lot of players, including many of our Aussies, where contract offer from China comes through. They look at the paycheck. They have no idea what the team is, no idea where the team is, who's coaching it, who's playing for it. They just see the bank account, and understandably so, and think, yep, I'll take that. Thank you very much. He's going to a team with Oscar, the former Chelsea superstar, a Hulk, another Brazilian superstar who plays up front, the striker, and uh, Marco Anautovic, who was a quality player for West Ham and Stoke over the years, an Austrian superstar, the Austrian Zlatan, they call him. So he's up against some quality players, and uh, that will ensure the standard of his football is probably maintained for the Socceroos. So all those things weighed up, I can understand him making the move. Garby, there's always a fight on not only, not only at club level, but at international level sometimes for players that have got multiple nationalities, multiple clubs and countries they can play for rather. And Lyndon Dykes, one of those, Australian born and bred, but his parents are Scottish. He's been playing in Scotland. He's just transferred to QPR after a few clubs are in the mix for him. And it looks like Scotland's managed to nick in and pinch him straight under our nose. You win some, you lose some. That's the way it goes in, in these battles, unfortunately. We've won a few recently. Martin Boyle, who I spoke about, Harry Suter. Martin Boyle had never been to Australia before, before he played for the Socceroos. And, uh, and he's lining up for us because of links with his family. Harry Suter as well was probably closer to Scotland than he was Australia. But we targeted them and we got them. But we've lost one in, in Lyndon Dykes. And it's a big one to lose because he's a big striker. And we know we have deficiencies in that area of the park. I'm not saying he's better than Taggart or McLaren, but geez, a striker who's just been signed by QPR for £2 million to play for them. And when you consider his physical stature, he'd have been very handy firstly in Asia and as another option for Graham Arnold moving forward. I get the feeling QPR, when they signed him, said, we'd probably prefer you to play for Scotland if you are weighing it up because, you know, Nicking off to the other side of the world or to parts of Asia every six weeks is, is not ideal in the middle of a championship season when you're playing Tuesday, Saturday, and as a big striker, you're going to be slogging it out against some Neanderthal centre-backs. Uh, so that's not ideal. And that may have swayed his decision. And it's a shame because whenever we lose a player that can add something to the national team, we should be dirty about it. But, you know, we've gained a few in the past. We've lost a few in the past. This is a disappointing one, especially considering in September, he said he was leaning towards Australia. But I dare say his club situation may have pushed him towards Scotland. And we just have to cop that and be wary that we've got to be super aggressive with every single Australian option that's presented to us. I mean, that's the game. And we can't afford to lose players who can add to our national team. Speaking of one of those, Alex Robertson, he qualifies for four different countries. Yeah. So there's going to be a heck of a tug of war for his services. Playing at the moment in the Manchester City junior system, scored a hat-trick recently. Australia, Scotland, England and Peru, which is through his <laughs> other side. He can play for all four. Again, another one that we should get. His father's represented the Socceroos, Mark Robertson. His grandfather's represented the Socceroos. 
So we shouldn't be losing a player who has that sort of link. Yes, he's been in England for a, a long time and his family's got strong Scottish roots. I don't think Peru would be an option. That doesn't seem <laughs> as much as I'm sure he's proud of his mother's heritage. It just seems like it would be too hard to manage that. But England would certainly be a viable option for a kid who's on Man City's books. And not only on Man City's books, was poached from Manchester United by Man City. That shows how talented he is. He scored a hat-trick the other day against Blackpool. Two of the goals were outstanding. He's got a long, long way to go. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. There have been plenty of 17, 18-year-old kids who have looked like world beaters who haven't gone on to make it. So let's just cool the expectations. But at the same time, as I said before, we can't afford to lose talents like this. So the FFA should be in his father's ear and trying to court Alex as best they can, inviting him into national team camps and showing him the love. Because a player of that talent, if he does match expectations, he's going to be a huge asset for the Socceroos moving forward. Do you give him a game in the senior team before he might be ready for it, Garby, just to warehouse him? No. And, and you know what? FIFA have shrewdly changed the rules on that, that you have to play a full international that means something for points in order to be capped. You can't just chuck him into a friendly. And they've done that so people don't, or countries don't warehouse players. So just throwing him into any old friendly to, to cap him for Australia um, would be unfair. And to put him into a World Cup qualifier or an Asian Cup qualifier before he's ready uh, is probably not right because you start to devalue the Australian shirt. But if he starts to jump up another level, you know, he may not necessarily be 100% ready, but if he gets a bit closer than what he is now, by all means, by all means, play the game. At this point in time, not quite. But, uh, you know, in a year or two, if he's not quite ready, yeah, then you probably would. But you know, bring him into an Ollie Roos camp. He can make the Olympic squad potentially. You know, let's not, let's not forget that. What a big opportunity that would be for him. And that would hopefully tie him closer to Australia. So, yeah, they've got to play the game to some extent. And then Cameron uh, Pepion, he's off to Brighton with Matty Ryan. That must be a real big advantage to have a fellow Aussie, you know I mean, to go through the journey yeah. with you. Massive advantage. Good point, Corey. That just changes everything, having an Aussie. Not just any old Aussie. Aaron Moy's a ripper guy, but we, don't, we all know Aaron's pretty quiet. To get a word out of him can be, can be tough sometimes. But Matt Ryan is you know, just someone who you know will put his arm around young Cameron and show him the way. And he's such a big personality at Brighton that... It'll give the young Aussie a, a leg up. But, you know, one thing I learned living over in, in Europe and, and watching our Aussies abroad is that an Aussie on the books at a Premier League club or any club at, at a big league in Europe, it doesn't mean much at academy level. It just doesn't. I mean, there's so many who have gone there and had a crack and come back and, and not necessarily made it in the A-League. You know, there's some who have and others who have gone to other teams and done well but it doesn't necessarily mean much. They're looking all over the world for young players. They see a video, they see a game where this player stands out, but for whatever reason, they don't develop into you know, the players that we hope they can. So hopefully that's not the case for Cameron. Hopefully he blossoms, but he's got a lot of work to do still. So yeah, whenever a player makes it in a Premier League or, or a big uh, academy abroad, I'd say just, just wait. Wait to see if they break through and get on the bench for the first team and then start getting excited. We've had some wonderful trailblazing Aussies on the pitch over the years, Garby, and their success opened the door for other Aussies to come through afterwards. But exciting, we're at a point now where that, that's happening on the sidelines as well. We're having Australian yeah. coaches now spread their wings and head across the world. And the same goes, doesn't it? If they have great success, that opens a door for more Aussies. And, and one of the more high-profile ones, obviously, Ange Postacoglu winning the title in Japan last year. Yeah, he's done a great job. And we'll wait and see if, Han, if Ange decides to take an opportunity in Europe in the future. He's at a big club. He's enjoying himself. He said a, a lot of ups and downs in recent times that we all know about. So he probably just wants to settle a bit, although he does have a strong desire to manage in Europe. But it's a halcyon time for Australian coaches. You speak of Ange, you know, Peter Klombowski, he's now managing in the J League on his own. Uh, and that's the he, impact we're talking about, isn't it? He exactly was Ange's, right. Ange's assistant. They win the title together. Clubs look yeah. at him and go, well, hang on, if you're with him, yeah, let's take one of those as well. Suddenly now there's two there. Yep. But that's Asia. So Asia, we, we've always had an advantage because we're part of the region and we're respected as a football nation in Asia. In Europe, different kettle of fish altogether. And Kevin Musker getting a chance there at St. Troyden is massive. It's an enormous opportunity for him and for Aussie coaches moving forward, as you say. And he started well there. Let's hope he can keep it going. COVID was a blessing for Kevin Musker because it allowed him to have, I think, a couple of months 
to show everyone there that he knows what he's talking about. He can build a relationship with the players. He can embed his tactical system and he probably started to win them over and then he attacks the season. So that's great for, for Kev. And there's Tony Popovich as well at Xanthi in Greece. He's going to go there now. And the benefit for him, he's going to have an Australian owner. So uh, that hopefully gives him time to get over those uh, cultural differences and, and uh, language issues with, with some of the players. So, yeah, it's fantastic. And, and Harry Kill's another big one as well that we can speak about. So, yeah, it's an unprecedented era for Aussie coaches abroad. And then, we look, you obviously mentioned uh, Kevin Musket. He's had great success at Melbourne Victory. What is, from your point of view, what does he have to do to go to another level to be able to then cement himself with a place amongst all the European coaches? Well, Kevin has to prove he can do it away from the Melbourne Victory, whether it was yeah. in Europe or here in Australia. All we've known from Kevin in the last 15 years is the Melbourne Victory. He stepped in there as a player, dominated, assistant coach under Ange, then a manager, it is easier to do it at a club where you know the fabric and the culture like the back of your hand. And, you know, he just set the tone for that place. And it's no surprise the victory have struggled since he's left. But now he needs to prove, and I'm sure he's aware of this, that he can do it somewhere else where he doesn't all have it um, basically at his beck and call and he can control the place because he's such a legend. And that's the big test for him. And hopefully he does well. I think he's a good enough manager that he'll be able to. We should speak about Harry Kiel as well, boys, because uh, his story is so interesting. I mean, I, I love what Harry's done and the fact that he's got another opportunity at Oldham. Because as I mentioned before with that Massimo Luongo story, League One, League Two in England, it is the furthest thing from glamour. And, you know, Harry's got the name, and let's be honest, enough money that he doesn't have to do this. He could pick and choose a media job or a, a striking role at a, at a big club or an academy coaching job and be happy doing that without pressure and without having to really dig your heels in in an unglamorous situation. But he's just desperate to get to the top and he's willing to do the hard yards. And I admire him so much for that. Uh, at Crawley Town, his first job, he did pretty well and he got another opportunity at a bigger club in Notts County. But, you know, they sacked him after two months they sacked two managers before him and hardly improved after Harry left. So I don't think it's a slight on him that he was discarded from them. Now he's got another opportunity at Oldham. A tough task, but let's hope he does well because he's worked his backside off to, to get an opportunity like this. And to put it in perspective, Garby, not every uh, English football club makes big money. Average player salary in Harry's team is about £40,000 for the season. The average manager's salary is about £80,000. And you look at facilities like Boundary Park, where Oldham Athletic play, it's not Old Trafford, that's for sure. No, it's tough. It's rough. I mean, I've seen it all before and we spoke about it. And, and Harry doesn't need to do it. And there are plenty others who don't want to do it. They're happy to take that media job or, or just work in the, the background of the club. And you know what? Fair play to them. I'm not knocking them at all. But uh, the fact that Harry's been willing to do that and go anywhere, really, to take that chance, fair play to him. And, you know, a lot of people are surprised that Harry's in coaching. A lot of people said, geez, watching him as a player and listening to him, I would never have picked him as a coach. And I've had this chat with Harry and I've asked him why that's the case. And, and I was of the same opinion. And he said, when I was a player, I was just so single-minded and narrow-minded and had tunnel vision on what I had to do to be the best player in the world. That was his goal then I didn't think about anything else. I didn't do any more media that I didn't have to do. I didn't think about tactics outside of my game or my team winning. But now that I'm a coach and I'm so desperate to be the best coach in the world, I'm open to everything. And my mind has changed completely and he's adopting the same mindset. And uh, I think people need to be aware of that before they judge Harry. Yeah, it's wonderful to see him go and do the hard yards, isn't it, as you say, when he doesn't need to. So he's obviously being driven by the passion. Let's talk about the women's game, Garby, because whilst we've got less men playing in the top levels around the world at the moment, we've got more women than ever. In fact, 36 current or future Matildas have, have made the trek over to Europe over the last 18 months or so. It's happened en masse. It's fantastic for them individually, both personally and professionally, but also for the Matildas as a program to be getting this sort of global experience leading into a home World Cup is just invaluable. It's awesome. And, you know, let's be honest, it's a product of big clubs around the world deciding they need to invest in what is an enormous sporting market. And that is the women's game. And obviously that's the case in football as well. I mean, some of the big clubs in Europe have been left behind Australia and America and Norway and, and other parts of, of Europe in recent times. But now that you've got big Premier League clubs investing in the women's game, you know, we've seen Sam Kerr go to Chelsea, Alana Kennedy go to Spurs. 
There's about 14 Aussies at, at Arsenal, I think. And Lydia <laughs> Williams. Uh, Caitlin Ford's there. Uh, Chloe Legazzo's, Legazzo's at Bristol City. Um, you've got uh, Emily Van Egmond, who's signed at West Ham, and so many others. It's amazing. It is great. And uh, it's big for our Matildas moving forward to test themselves in that environment. And uh, it's great to see it, you know, the investment in the women's game like that from such big clubs. And, you know, someone like Caitlin Ford, she'll have that tag with her for the rest of her life. I played for Arsenal. Now, regardless of how much money she's earning, that tag is worth so much. It's a legacy that lasts forever. And uh, it's great that our Australian players are being so sought after in, uh, in that respect. And that road... Garby, look to the 2023 World Cup. It's it's obviously going to be unbelievable for the country. Do you find now that, look, our Matildas are really going to be under pressure from the weight of expectation that you've got the Sam Kerrs and you've yeah. all this talent that we've got? It's going to be intriguing to see how they really cope with this weight of expectation in the home country. No doubt. And, you know, I thought they struggled a bit with the World Cup in France in 2019, albeit in very difficult circumstances because of the Alan Stadgic affair, which was just a ridiculous, bemusing, sad situation that happened months before it. And the full impact of, of that on the players, I think, was underestimated in terms of the pressure and the questions they were being asked and the way they were being judged in every game. It took its toll on them. That experience should hold them in good stead. And uh, the fact that they're all playing in Europe in a pressurising situation, putting themselves in a comfort zone that they are not going to be all the, at all times familiar with, I think it's going to help them going into that World Cup and uh, hopefully get galvanised them a bit more when they meet for the Matildas too. So it's big for us. It's big for the Australian game as a whole. Let's be honest. It's something we're pinning our hopes on over the next four years. Amid the difficult times in the A-League and in Australian football financially, that World Cup was obviously a blessing. And, uh, you know, we need the girls to have a great few years leading up to it and then hopefully excel on home soil. And the fact they're at big clubs under pressure, you know, these big moves, it's going to be only advantageous for them. Ali Carpenter's only been there five minutes. She's already got a trophy cabinet full. <laughs> she went to Lyon. She certainly picked the right club. What a powerhouse they are. Yeah, and she won the Champions League there. Brilliant, brilliant. And Ellie's such a talented player. You know, at the World Cup, I think defensively she got found out a bit, but that was mainly the team tactic as opposed to her personal game. Um, she's no doubt will improve in that area of her game over in France. But as an attacking right back, if there's a better one in the world, you know, I'd love to see it. And that's why Leon signed her and great to see her win the Champions League there. Do you think, Arby, it could be a case that the, the Women's World Cup and the, and, the, and the women could be the ones that really give the men's A-League a kick along that it probably really needs at the moment? Because the A-League, after the momentum of the last few years, seems like it's really going through a bit of a lull at the moment, but something like the World Cup can just reinvigorate football in Australia full stop. No doubt. I mean, all roads lead to that, let's be honest. And, uh, you know, from an FFA point of view, financially, that will hopefully be something that carries the organisation through the next five years. And when the losses inevitably come, which they will, probably from a broadcasting point of view, first and foremost for the A-League, hopefully the money that's generated from that Women's World Cup, be it sponsorship, um, be it, you know, broadcast revenue, and then the actual event when it happens, you know, can help underpin the rest of the game and we can all build up together. So, yeah, we're very fortunate that we've been awarded this, but you know, at the same time, they worked very hard to get it with all of those aspects, Corey, in mind. Garby, part of the Socceroos journey to World Cup success and actually making it through to the World Cup finals was, I guess, the path to that was guys going and playing overseas, learning to play different styles of football mm. against different types of opponents, bringing IP back against other opponents that they might have played with or against at club level. The Matildas, they went on mass to sort of America. When I say on mass, you know, half a dozen, eight to 10 of them went sort of five, six years ago, played a lot of football in America. Now they're broadening their football horizons, playing in Europe against players all over the world. Are they going to have that same benefit, the Matildas? We line up against a particular team and you can say, yeah, I played with her, or I played against her over in Europe and I can tell you she does this, she does that. This is the way she plays. No doubt. It'll have an, an enormous impact. And it's not just the playing style, it's, it's the cultural differences in a dressing room. You know, dealing with personalities that don't always match up with yours, dealing with a coach that doesn't always match up with you, but it hardens them as players and it toughens them for, for the pressure that comes with the World Cup. And that'll be beneficial for them as well. But certainly from a tactical point of view, no doubt, um, just broadening your horizons a lot. I mean, our best players 
They went America, Australia, and that was their season. And now it's going to be, you know, America potentially, but a lot of it just flat out in Europe and then Matilda's games. And yeah, it's going to just open up their minds and, and their ability. But, you know, we're already right up there. So we're not far off it. But, you know, looking at taking Australia from a quarterfinal team to a semi final and then potential winner of a World Cup, which is what we want, or Olympic medalist, of course, which is enormous in the women's game, that can potentially be a catalyst to, to help the girls make that step up. And you listen to managers in the past, the difference between that and the top is often above the shoulders, isn't it? It's yeah. having that composure, that maturity, that poise under pressure, being able to deal with expectation, as Corey said before. And they're all in the perfect position right now where they're going to be playing big games. There is going to be expectation. A whole lot of opponents they've never seen before. And they'll have that sense of playing international football pretty much every weekend. The time is now. I mean, this is their golden generation. They can't waste this opportunity. You know, as good as the talent pool and production line is coming through, you're not going to have another Sam Kerr. I mean, you're talking about arguably the best player in the world. And the depth of talent that have all been signed for England, I'm sure we'll have more players coming through in the women's game because it's such a big sport here. And the Matildas, no doubt, have influenced a whole new group of players coming through. But this is a golden generation. Their time is now. They stuffed up the last World Cup with a stagic debacle, no doubt. That set them back. They've got to make the most of this opportunity. The coaching appointment will be enormous for the Matildas moving forward. There's a vacancy there. That will be so interesting. But, uh, you know, the players have got to take their chance and they're fully aware of that. Garby, let's talk about your personal journey, your personal Aussies abroad journey, because it's a fascinating one. You started over in Perth, you moved to Melbourne, up through the ranks, behind the scenes at nine, ended up on air at Fox Sports. How did the move to Europe as their Fox Sports correspondent eventuate? How did that take place? Funny story. So, I mean, I was working, although I was working behind the scenes at nine, I was also working at SEN in Melbourne as their football correspondent, if you like. So I was in the Aussie football media uh, circle and I'd made a few contacts in that time. And basically David Davudovic, who's a good friend of mine, uh, he worked at the Herald Sun for a number of years and was over in the UK doing some stuff for Fox. Uh, he had the job before me and I used to say to him basically in jest, uh, if you're ever coming home, give me the tip because I'd like to put my name forward. And one day he called me and told me, yeah, he was coming home. And if I want to put my name forward, this is the person to call. And I'd never met the executive producer of Fox properly. I'd come across him a few times, but I just thought, let's take a punt. What's the worst that can happen? Called him up one day and said, I want to put my name forward for this. Flew to Sydney a few days later, met him in person. He said, yep, we'll give you a crack. There was nothing guaranteed. It was a freelance job. I was well aware that if I was no good, they could have turfed me a month into the season and I was on my own in London, but I knew it was too good of an opportunity to, to pass up. So I quit my job at nine, packed up all my stuff within two months and I was over at uh, the sideline of the Hawthorns, West Brom against Man United for my first ever game. It was terrible early on, but lucky enough, they uh, persisted with me, gave me a crack and it turned into five years. So I took a punt and paid off and uh, I'm forever grateful for it. And Garber, you've been pretty fortunate with your role that you pitch side, you know, I mean, at the biggest stadiums in the world, uh, you, you're seeing the Aussies up close, but which one out of all those, I know you're a mad Liverpool fan, but which is your pinch yourself moment where you just go, it does not get any better than this? <laughs> There are so many. I mean, honestly, to separate one from the bunch is hard. I mean... Just give us the bunch, Garvey. We're loving it. Okay, so I'll go through them all quickly. I mean, being a Liverpool fan, you know, to get to my seat at Liverpool games, I would have to walk literally through the tunnel, past both changing rooms, <laughs> down past the This Is Anfield sign, onto the pitch to get to my seat. I mean, mm -hmm. as a Liverpool fan from Perth, it was like, this is ridiculous. Every time I got to do it, it was just an amazing experience. So... That's obviously up there, but stepping onto the Emirates or Old Trafford or the Etihad, any of those stadiums, White Hart Lane, all just memorable. I mean, I was lucky enough to go to an El Clasico in Spain. Fox Sports had the La Liga rights for, uh, for one season, and I was pitch side before Barcelona, Real Madrid, up until 10 minutes before kickoff, standing next to John Aloisi. And I said to John Aloisi, because I was awestruck, how good is this? The Bernabeu, wow, imagine playing here. You must have played here. He goes, played here? I scored in that goal. <laughs> so that was a great Aussies abroad moment as well to, uh, to relive that with John Aloisi. That was incredible. Leicester winning the title. That's one moment that I'll never forget because I saw the true brilliance of sport and what it can do for a city as the whole world of sport converged on, I'll be honest, a pretty boring town in England that doesn't register on the radar normally and just 
gravitate around this absurdly good sporting story, the best sporting story on field for mine that I've ever seen, uh, the best achievement anyway. So that was remarkable to be there covering Leicester. I just loved every minute of that. So all of those come to mind. They were just such great moments. And of course, covering the Socceroos abroad, most notably the World Cups are just a thriller minute experiences. Matt Ryan first started playing football at the age of four. Firstly, as a striker and an attacking midfielder who loved scoring goals. That was until a neighbour's dad asked him if he'd be interested in filling in as the goalkeeper for their under 10s team. Matt was also a competitive tennis player through his teenage years, but broke too many rackets getting all fired up. His mum wasn't too impressed. In the end, he chose soccer because of the camaraderie of his mates. And Aussie soccer fans are certainly glad that he did. He's become a sentinel for the Socceroos between the sticks over the last decade. Matty, welcome to Aussies Abroad. You've certainly come a long way from the Marconi uh, Stallions and the Blacktown City Demons. It's a, it's a long way from there to, to Brighton in the Premier League, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I've still got to pinch myself sometimes. Um, but yeah, the, the journey has been... You know, an amazing one, and I'm just trying to enjoy, you know, every every second of it. So, uh, yeah, I, you know, recently just played my hundredth game in the Premier League, and definitely when I was back there in those Marconi and Blacktown days, uh, I never thought I would ever achieve one. So, uh, it's it's a pretty special uh, achievement to have. Looking back on it, is it all gone pretty fast? I mean, you made your professional debut with the Mariners, and even that gave you a really early introduction into just how fickle and unpredictable football can be. You came into that Mariners youth squad as the third string keeper, and within a month, you were playing senior A League football at 18 years of age just because of circumstances around you. Yeah, I mean, I've certainly seen how life and football can be a, a, a sort of whirlwind, and you know, like opportunities you know being presented in front of you um you know coming from left field and all these types of things and i guess you know in life my experiences have told me you just got to be there and waiting and, and ready to take your opportunity when it comes around and uh thankfully on a few occasions i've i guess i've been able to do that in hindsight and you know the life i'm living because of it is is been amazing and like i said just enjoying every second of it and you know, for me, as, as corny as it sounds, you know, I'm living my dream and, um, you know, life life is pretty good. You've always been one to learn your lessons quickly. And I, I know in your first game, you had, you made a mistake. It gave up a goal. You felt bad about it. But Graham Arnold put his arm around you after the, the next week and said, hey, this is your spot to lose and gave you some confidence. And straight away, you went on and had a, a fantastic first season. I think you had 12 clean sheets, which was an A-lead record at the time. It's important, isn't it, when you're a young athlete coming in, one, to have someone show confidence in you, and two, to be able to believe in yourself and learn your lessons quickly. Yeah, definitely. Um, I've been very fortunate to have a lot of people around me that um, have really supported me. And, you know, Arnie, um, John Crawley, they were definitely two people, uh, especially there in that, um, you know, initial stages of my professional career, beginning there at the Mariners and, you know, the belief that they instilled um, within me um, is definitely a big step to um, what I've achieved in the game, you know, post the Mariners and, and obviously during that time there. And, um, you know, I was fortunate enough to have those types of people around me to teach me such lessons as, um you know, the importance of bouncing back and, and learning from experiences and um, the process of, I guess, going through moments like those and, and how you best deal with them in terms of, um, you know, getting the best for yourself moving forward. And, you know, the couple of teachers that I had in them that were around me uh, at that time um, were definitely very helpful in in me learning very efficiently those uh, those lessons. And, um, have definitely helped me to get to where I am today. You had a great first year in the A-League and by midway through your second year, the chatter was starting about you potentially going to Europe. Was that always part of your grand plan? Did you have, when you were starting out, certainly as a kid, but then by the time you'd made it to the A-League and were starting to go okay, was the plan then to try and get overseas as soon as possible? Or did it just kind of happen for you? Um, yeah, I mean, I was, as a kid, I was always outside playing sport. Uh, and, and it's, it's what I love doing and you know I remember having many conversations to and from school with my mom and just you know and, and my friends that played football at the time at that young age and 
you know, always talked about obviously the leagues overseas and how grand it would be if one day we were able to achieve that. But, you know, I always felt I had a bit of doubt inside me as if whether I could reach that level or not. And, you know, being an Australian footballer and having to move overseas and do all that and the difficulties of playing at a level like that over in Europe and, um, you know, all those little questions you, you have if you're good enough to, to get there. And um, I guess along the journey, I was just sort of, sort of how I've always approached it, just ticking off each day as it comes type of thing and trying to be the best that I can be. And um, like I said, I've had plenty of people around me which have helped provide me with the tools in order to get the best um, out of myself as, as a footballer and as a goalkeeper. And um, I guess, yeah, when, you know, that second season came around and, um, you know, there started to be some talk about going overseas and, you know, playing with some international footballers there at the Mariners that have played in Europe and, you know, them giving you confidence that, you know, when you spoke honestly with them, that they saw something in me to suggest that, yeah, I had the potential to um, explore a European career. And thankfully, um, Mile Stajowski, obviously my former teammate who had a career in Europe, uh, offered to, to help me in in my career to you know keep progressing and to help hopefully try explore an opportunity overseas and thankfully it all panned out where I was able to get my opportunity there with uh, club club Bruges come come knocking and um, you know wanted to acquire my services and uh, yeah it was a, another great uh, great moment in my career. You actually started out having a trial with Spurs, didn't you? You went across and had a trial with Spurs and you're on the park with the likes of uh, Gareth Bale and Jermaine Defoe and Raphael van der Vaart. What was that like? Just to uh, firstly go over, as you said, you had a few question marks in the back of your mind, which was totally natural, to sort of say, well, let's see what I can do against guys like this. Yeah, I believe that was after my second season in the A-League. So, yeah, yep. once a little bit of chatter had happened and um, as much as it, it was you know, a sort of trial, I guess, to go over there. It was, it was more of an experience type of thing as well and sort of just to see what may happen um, from that experience. But, yeah, to go over there and all of a sudden, you know, be rubbing shoulders with the guys that, you know, you're watching on, on you know, TV, playing at the highest level, playing at the pinnacle of the game, you know, across all media outlets all across the world about, you know, the magic that they've produced on the weekend for, you know, their teams and how they've done it over and over again. And guys you play with on FIFA and you're in awe of. And, you know, to be out there on the pitch with them, mixing it with them was probably, you know, that was the, the first moment when I look back in my career where I was like, fuck, you know, this is, uh, this is a little bit what it's like, you know, to be at that level, to be at that pinnacle. And, um, you know, to see the likes of these guys that are obviously portrayed in the media to be, you know, gods of football and stuff like that. It was um, it was quite a cool experience and, you know, another one of those experiences which I learned a lot from and, um, you know, I was very thankful to, for the experience and it definitely helped uh, my progression as well. How long did it take for that sort of sense to wear off or indeed does it still when you play against someone who's a massive name on the football world stage to look across and go, well, gee, there's whoever it might be, Cristiano Ronaldo or whoever it is you're coming up against at the time, do you still get not starstruck exactly, but you still just sort of stop and pinch yourself for a minute and go, wow, I'm actually here out here with all these amazing players in, uh, in the world and I'm one of them. Yeah, I mean, funnily enough, I haven't actually come across Ronaldo yet in a game. Um, it, it would be nice, you know, if I can get the opportunity to play against him. But I think it's, yeah, it's an experience type of thing. Uh, you know, once once I got to England here and was playing regularly, uh, you know, at the pinnacle of the game in a league like this, um, you know, more so in the beginning, it was, uh, I guess, a little bit more eye-opening um, to be in awe of certain teams and players that you come across or you come up against. And, yeah, I mean, like anything with experience, the more you do it, um, the more it just sort of became games against, you know, an opposition with... I don't know, 17, 18, you know, people there on, on on the team sheet and just wanting to be, you know, super competitive like I've always been and, and beat these individuals no matter who they are. And, um, yeah, it was probably took a, a fair chunk of that first season where you just, I guess, you stop thinking about who it is you're coming up against and um, you just wanted to go out there and do your best and, 
um, you know, once again, through my own experiences, it's provided me some of my best moments in my life when I've been able to be successful through making saves or winning games against, you know, some of the, the best players and clubs to, to ever play the game. When you first arrived in Bruges, again, the, the fickle finger of football fate, as it were, um, panned out your way because it looked like um, initially you were going to be the backup, but then the main keeper got injured and suddenly, again, you're thrown into the mix and get an opportunity. Yeah, um, yeah, got the move, obviously, the dream move from Australia there, the Mariners, to, to Club Bruges. And I knew it was a club uh, with a lot of history, uh, a lot of respect in the football world. Uh, quite often, you know, they were appearing in Champions Leagues and, you know, the old UEFA um, league and leagues and, and all those types of things. And, you know, had quite a bit of history in terms of trophies and all that. And, uh, yeah, to, to have you know, being picked up by them was, you know, very exciting. And uh, I remember, I still remember to to this day, um, you know, arriving there and then unpacking my bag and it all just hit me in in that moment that I was no longer, um, you know, a drive away from seeing my family or anything like that. And it was quite difficult to take in the beginning. And I remember, you know, getting some tears in my eyes, you know, with the realisation of, of all that, uh, that I'm on the opposite side of the world to everyone. And uh, yeah, it was a little bit difficult in the beginning and even more so when I sort of got a sense that maybe I wasn't going to be the number one keeper in the beginning. Um, but then, yeah, I guess did what I had learned up until now and put my head down and decided, you know, started to obviously work. And, um, you know, thankfully there, well, not thankfully for the other goalkeeper, but for myself in that moment, an injury to him sort of opened a little window and um, I played a few friendly games before the season started in a row and come the first game of the season, that, that keeper that I thought was going to start um, was fit again, and but uh, the manager stuck with me and and you know, I went on to play, you know, all the games pretty much from, from there on out in, in my time there at Club Bruges and create many more... Um, you know, great memories that uh, that I'll always cherish. I came and visited you in Bruges in that first season. In fact, I think we went out for your 21st birthday, didn't we? When you think back, you were still so young and you were still sort of struggling with homesickness a little bit and starting to adjust. Did that eventually fade over time or do you still long for home even though you've been in Europe sort of seven years now? Um, yeah, I think it, it does get, I guess, a, a bit easier. Um, you get used to things a little bit more and the way that, that life is. Um, I don't think you ever stop missing them less or anything like that. It's just, I guess you get in a bit of a routine and things just flow by. And before you know it, you know, you've been away seven years and uh, yeah, looking back now, time, time flies, but uh, you know, it's, it's definitely the hardest part is, is missing the family or not being close to the family and, you know, close friends that you've grown up with and developed obviously, you know, close relationships with, but, um, you know, in saying all that, I wouldn't hesitate in, in doing it again, um, you know, for the opportunities that I've had in my life, because um, the life that I'm living is something that, you know, people only, you know, dream of, or only a small percentage of people ever get to experience. And I'm, I'm so thankful for that. And um, the life that that's been able to provide, you know, my loved one, that loved ones as well, the experiences that we shared, it's, you know, it's been great and I'm, like I said, I'm enjoying every second of it. I remember you telling me at the time that it was such a different style of football in Belgium. It was much more open, much more action for you as a keeper. I think you told me that you made something like more saves in 10 weeks in Belgium than you made in your entire season at the Mariners. How long did it take you to adjust and feel like you belonged in uh, European football? Yeah, um, in, yeah, any time I've, I've changed teams or, or anything like that, there's always been that adjustment period in the beginning, you know, getting used to certain styles of football with, a, you know, a change of manager and a change of style and also, you know, a change of teammates and, you know, try and understand, yeah, your players and who you're playing with and what their strengths and weaknesses are and, and likewise them with yourself and, you know, how you like to play and those types of things. So um, it was probably... It's probably after a good, I'd say, two to three months of being there where, you know, you start to feel like you belong. And, you know, the quickest way you, you gain the respect of your, your teammates is by being able to produce on the football pitch. Uh, I think that's, yeah, the, you know, the, the most sure and, and quick way to gain their respect and 
um, thankfully, you know, having come in and, and started, I was able to achieve that quite quickly and um, was able to establish myself within the team and, you know, build some relationships with the guys there. And, um, and yeah, it, it helped in, you know, hopefully us having the results that we did in, in winning plenty of games. You had two years there at Bruges, then you moved to a big league for the first time. You went to La Liga with Valencia. And again, you saw the fickle nature of the business, didn't you? You came in to replace Diego Alves, who had uh, done his ACL. Then you got injured. Then the replacement came in, did a good job. You fought your way up again to the rotation. Then Diego came back. So it was all, again, another one of those whirlwinds. It just shows you just how fickle and cutthroat the business side of the sport can be. Yeah, uh, exactly that. You know, summed up. Um... Yeah, probably you forgot to mention we had maybe well in my period there we had five different coaches or something like that. <laughs> well, that's right. On top of all of that as well, it was even crazier. Yeah. So, uh, you know, the first time in my career I'd sort of experienced not being the number one keeper, of, you know, at a club and, and not playing. So like being fit but not being out on the pitch and playing, and um, yeah, that that brought with it a lot of yeah stress and, and difficult times in in dealing with that. Um, you know, a lot of questions were coming in, you know, well, what am I doing away from my family and all that if I'm not out there playing on the pitch, you know, it's sort of, for me, I had the feeling that it's, it's not worth being away from them if I can't be out there contributing and, and all those types of things. But, you know, it taught me little lessons like, you know, not take it for granted, you know, when you are the number one goalkeeper and playing and, you know, little lessons like that. And like I said, that the cutthroat industry of, of especially playing at the highest level where competition for spots is, is so high with, you know, clubs, you know, like Valencia that I was at having um, the funds in order to go and recruit, you know, two or three very good players for every position and, um, you know, the co competition for places that that brought. And, um, you know, even though it wasn't, I guess the, the best period in my career in terms of playing and all that, it was still very educational in, in that fact. And, you know, learned many lessons, um, which once again have helped me, you know, become the, the person and the goalkeeper that I am today. But uh, yeah, pretty, pretty difficult times. And also going to another culture where it was probably the first country or definitely is the first country where English wasn't so well spoken there. And, you know, learnt another language, which I never thought I would ever speak sort of once I left school or anything like that. Never thought I'd learn another language and went and did that and tried to immerse myself within the culture. And um, there was another period of my life which has, um, you know, been very special and, and very memorable for, you know, both good and bad reasons. One of the great pieces of advice I remember you telling me that Mark Schwarzer gave you very early in your career before you actually went to Europe is the importance of going somewhere where you can play. You went out on loan back to Belgium while you were with uh, Valencia and played with Yink. And then obviously there were going to be some opportunities open up. Was there a range of opportunities for you to get back into the big league at that stage? And why did you pick the Seagulls? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, during that period, um, you know, the information from the club, from Valencia, um, was that they saw me as the, the future of the club. Um, you know, the goalkeeper that they wanted between the sticks and all this type of, you know, of, of um, feedback that they were giving me. And um, given a little bit of my turbulent start there with the injuries and the changes of coaches and all this stuff that was happening, um, you know, we, well, it, it ended up that I was able to leave on loan to, yeah, with the idea of going to Genk to, you know, get some rhythm again and, you know, the feeling of playing and, um, you know, all that comes with that confidence and all those types of things. And, and then to come back to Valencia, you know, to hopefully reclaim the starting spot there and, and help them. Um, as you know, you know, in the football world, like I said, it goes in each and every direction. You never know what's around the corner. And all of a sudden, before I knew it, I was on my way to, to Brighton. Uh, basically, you know, under the guidance of my, my agent who I've been with since I left Australia. Um, Brighton were interested for, for quite a while. And um, in that season, just before I'd sort of, or just as I'd got to Genk, I think, they were already interested in, in me or had um, contacted my agent because it looked like that they were going to get promoted uh, from the championship into the Premier League. And um, little did I know at that time, the goalkeeper coach for Brighton, Ben Roberts, was um, very keen on what he saw in me, I guess, as a goalkeeper. And he was actually a former teammate of my agent. 
and um, yeah, they were obviously in contact regularly. And the longer the season went on, there when I was in Genk, the the more you know they were speaking, and the interest became stronger. And um, in one moment, uh, my agent told Ben uh, to get the club to contact Valencia to um, to see what the situation was because ourselves, for my personal situation. The club wasn't really given too much away in terms of what they were seeing that was going to be happening for the the following year, and um, it was a tactical move from from my agent to get you know Ben and Brighton to sort of ask on behalf of another club officially to see what the situation was, and that's how we sort of found out where we were sort of left with the club because they accepted to have a meeting with Brighton and. The outcome of the meeting was that they had accepted a transfer fee between the two clubs. So that was basically how I found out that uh, I guess the club were happy to to let me leave and explore other opportunities. And um, Brighton at that moment was the real only concrete thing that we had because it all sort of happened so quickly and pretty early on. So. That's how it all played out. What was it like to walk into an organisation that had just been promoted? And I mean, the difference between being a championship side and a Premier League side, just in terms of the money that comes in the door and the resources and everything has to be upscaled and the fans must be so pumped. What was it like to walk into an organisation like that? Yeah, I mean, pr- pressure, um, similar but, but different. Um, yeah, pressure and, and goals and expectations type of things from from the club. I mean, in my career, I'd sort of played for clubs which were, you know, more competing for titles and, and you know, winning things. And even in Valencia, um, we were, in that first season, we were, I think, 13th or 14th. So we were, you know, we were close to the relegation places, uh, you know, at times. But, you know, being a big club like Valencia, we were always pretty confident that, you know, what it was to be at a club like Valencia with the quality that it could bring that we were, you know, we were never sort of really in the dogfight to get relegated. But, you know, coming to obviously a smaller club like Brighton and arriving there and, you know, there's some silly, you know, number statistics that like, I think two of every three clubs that get promoted, you know, get relegated straight away in that first season and, you know, then I think there's another statistic of, you know, of a team that gets promoted. It's a very high percentage of them that then gets relegated within two or three years, you know. So, you know, a lot of these, I guess, facts are being thrown your way when you join a club like that. And um, you know, a lot of people writing you off and doubting you and all these types of things and, you know, not having the luxury of having, obviously, the the budgets of other clubs to go out and, and buy you know, all these players that, you know, bring you this success and all these types of things, uh, you sort of, your backs are against the wall and, you know, survival is, is basically like winning the league for us, especially in, you know, those first initial years. And um, it's, I think it's, I think it's even more tense um, than when you're competing for a title because, you know, at least with a title, if you don't win it, you have an opportunity to go back and do it the following year. But with relegation, if you don't achieve the goal of, you know, getting safe and surviving, then the following year you're in the league below. You don't get that opportunity again. So it's it's, it's almost a a more cutthroat um, ending uh, or environment. So and everything gets broken up too, isn't it? That's the other thing. If you go back down to the championship, the whole team will get busted up. Blokes will leave and go elsewhere to still be in the Premier League or in a top league. So the consequences, it's not as you say, it's not just like, oh well, guys, we'll dust ourselves off, have a preseason, and come back and have another crack. It's like, nah, the place will get blown apart. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's something that you probably don't recognise so much in Australia. Um, you know, you come the end of the season, if you're not doing well, it's like, ah, oh, yeah, well, you know, we have next season to do it. Um, it doesn't really matter. It's, you know, you don't get that luxury over here in, in Europe with um, the competitions and the, the relegation in place. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty, you know, scary stuff being down there. And, um, yeah, but, you know, in saying that, during those times, you, you obviously think positively, you know, you think you're going to get out of those situations and, Thankfully for us here at Brighton, you know we've um, we've made a knack of uh, yeah finding a way to get over the line and, and survive and um, you know keep achieving that goal and 
you know, in doing that's created many memories and, um, you know, no one can take away from us now three successful seasons in the Premier League and, you know, we're always looking to build on that and, and try to do better than the previous season. Andrew Osadi started his football journey as a professional player, playing in Italy for a couple of seasons as a teenager in the early 90s before a serious knee injury curtailed his playing career. He returned to Australia and became a journalist and first hit the radar of Aussie football fans as an up-and-coming young host on SBS's world game coverage from the mid-90s to the mid-2000s, alongside legends like Les Murray and Johnny Warren and Craig Foster. Andrew then moved to the US, joined ESPN, where he and I worked together for a number of years before he headed off to Amsterdam to take up a high-ranking role with FIFPRO, the Global Players Union. And these days, he's their Director of Marketing, Communications and Corporate Affairs. Andrew joins us to provide a global perspective on Aussies in the game. Andrew, welcome back to Aussies Abroad. People may remember that back in the day you actually hosted an Aussies Abroad feature. I think it was Vince Grella, wasn't it, back in his Blackburn days? It was. I remember going to his home on the fringes of Manchester in Alderley Edge. Uh, in fact, I caught up with Vince uh, recently because he's the agent for Daniel Arzani, who just signed for Utrecht in the top division in, uh, in the Netherlands. So we, we caught up and we spoke about that. I remember that Aussies Abroad because his wife made me the most unbelievable pasta <laughs> while the camera crew was getting ready for the interview and all that. Well, it's a little things that you remember. It's a nice touch, mate. With your role with FIFA Pro these days, you deal with player challenges and player issues around the world all the time. From an Aussie perspective, what are the things that Aussie players need to deal with, the hurdles that they have to overcome if they want to go and, and forge a career in, say, Europe? Many, uh, depending on when you leave. How mature are you when you leave the country? If you leave as a teenager, you break your social structure that you're so familiar with, your school friends, your family, you leave that all behind to a degree because you go very far away from home. You need to cope with different languages, different food, different climate, a different level of competitiveness. The demands of professional football to be at the top all the time means it puts a certain amount of mental stress on you. And so then you wonder, how do you cope with every training session when the demands are higher? What happens when you start playing official matches and you're being scrutinized every moment of the day by the media? So then the whole environment around you changes and, and you need to be mature enough to deal with that, to handle that. And that's a big question. Is the player ready to go and fend for him or herself? Uh, and, and I think later in life, it's easier to accept as parents letting their children go, let's say in their mid to late twenties. But we're in the, when they're in those formative years of their education, they're finishing up their high school certificate, they're, they're still toiling with the idea of education. How much time do I spend on my schoolwork versus my professional career as a player where I'm going to get paid now as a 17, 18, 19 year old. Those are questions that you really need to balance and take care of yourself first and foremost. You know, what do I need for myself to have a good life, not just a great career as a player? That might be the priority now, but as we all know, as you get on in life, you need that balance. So it's good to start sooner rather than later, in my opinion. And I think that helps you take the decisions necessary when you go abroad, because it's not just going away from home, but then once you're there, so much changes because it's big business in, in professional football. So much changes around you. If you play well after three months, you're immediately noticed. That means you then go to the next level of what do I do? Do I go to a different team? This one is telling me how good I am. How do I cope with all the adulation? You know, everyone's telling me I'm so great. But that won't always be the case. The key is wherever you go, you need to be consistent every day in every training session and every match as much as possible because that is ultimately what will survive the test of time. It's so cutthroat, isn't it, Andrew? And there are some unscrupulous operators around the world and some horror stories that you deal with, just some terrible things that you can't believe would happen to pro athletes in 2020. Yeah, well, I think it's, it's simple as this. What does the contract look like? Have you had it checked, triple checked? right? What does your employment contract say? And basically, as players, we go somewhere and we expect minimum conditions, right? It starts with pay, okay? Because if you have, doesn't matter what the level is, and don't forget, you know, we've surveyed players around the world, uh, around half of the surveyed players from 2016 were earning anywhere between a thousand and two thousand US dollars net per month, Okay, so this is not about the top 1%, the Ronaldos and Messi's driving Lamborghinis and Ferraris. That's not the reality. The reality is you're going to go somewhere. You're going to be given a contract. 
but is that contract worth the paper it's written on? Will you get paid on time? Will you get paid at all? What is the history of that country? Is there a track record that shows a, a series of disputes between foreign players particularly and that country? Because you can get those stats. Those stats are available at FIFA. International disputes or foreign players who end up in an argument with their club over salary mostly, because I think it's over you know, 90% of the cases that go to FIFA are mostly over the, the payment disputes between players and clubs. And so if that's the case, and you know a country is not going to probably pay you on time, and then you're going to face stress with your rent and, and all the other things that you have, your commitments abroad, then the question is, why are you going there at all? Is, it, is pay all, is all that matters to you and what the number is on paper? Or are you looking at it holistically? Is it doing the right things for me to develop, to continue to be in the shop window, to, to play regular matches at a good level that would allow me to then be seen by my national team to represent the Socceroos or the Matildas, to then be seen by other clubs to progress? Because don't forget, when you go away, it's incredibly important, the choices you make early on, that allow you to get on that, hopefully, an upward trajectory because you want to maximize your potential in a short space of time. If I go overseas at 18 and sign my first professional contract, Jace, well, the question is, what am I going to do between 18 and 28? You can't plan everything, but if there's a 10 year plan by 28, I want to be representing my country. At least that's what I would have been doing regularly in the first team. That's what I would have been hoping for for myself because I would say in my late 20s, I'm at my peak. But what do you need to do to get there? Am I in the right clubs from 18 to 21? What happens between 21 and 24? Am I making the steps necessary that I'm continually improving? So all of these things are critical and you need to watch out for the pitfalls because there are agents, there are other people lurking on the fringes who see you as a commodity, who want to maximize profit off of you for themselves. The money leaves the game, it goes to an advisor. And don't get me wrong, some of these advisors are great. Okay, they're great. They have the best interest of the player at heart. But their interest is for the player to keep moving in his or her career so that they can maximize on every deal, sign on bonuses, and all these things that come around. So you need to have real advice around you, which is independent in my view, so that whenever you get tripped up by anything that comes your way, whether it's non-payment, whether it's you've been abused in a club because of your sexuality, uh, because of uh, the color of your skin, uh, because you've been attacked by fans violently during a training session or after, you finish training with your family out for a coffee, you get abused because you know, you're on the back of a string of poor results. All those things that happen that disrupt and fracture the employment relationship with your club. And it gets even worse than that you know, at times. You know? so, so you need to be able to deal with it. And, and you need an army of people, I think, around you. And that's why in the player associations where I work at the global level with FIFPRO, we have 65 members in each, in each of these different countries where professional football is being played. And that's somewhere to turn to. Yeah, sure, you pay a membership, but what happens when something goes wrong? You have advice, free legal advice, advice about your career, education to transition to life after sport. So you need to have a full package, right, in order to succeed. And I think that's it. Balance is key always. The women's game has been a great success story over recent years. Why is the women's game blossoming now? Uh, well, I think it's just um, starting to... Uh, kick off in, in so many different areas. First of all, the players themselves have been incredible ambassadors, hugely engaged with FIFPRO and our player associations, driving their federations, pushing them into a corner if necessary with uh, all kinds of industrial action if needed, boycotts of tours, uh, stopping games if they have to, because they're not just being respected at all. Their rights have been completely like put to the side. And I liken it to the period of women fighting for the right to vote. Well, women in football worldwide are fighting for the right to have access, for girls to have opportunities like the boys, to play on the same fields as boys, to have the same conditions that allow them to thrive. And at the top end of town, when you're talking about the elite players at the national team level, they need conditions that allow them to train every day, to focus on themselves. That means they need a salary. That means they need so many things that allow them to just be the best player they can be. Whereas women up until now have always juggled between playing, working a job or studying. And so they've always had a limited amount of time. The, the financial resources are not there. They've been playing on insufficient venues, not enough matches in camps and so on. And, and now you see a shift where world football has woken up to the reality that women's game is growing exponentially, that it is viable commercially, that it might not be at the same level of the men commercially speaking, but it's on an upward trajectory and it's going to get there to, a, to a, at least 
a place where you can see a great deal of activity around it from everyone, sponsors, um, you know, just people wanting to work with women more and more. And you see, you see up until now that has been restrained. I mean, just look at the recent history, Jason, even in England, the game for women, you could not play. You were banned from playing as a woman between 1920 and 1970. They have been historically held back. There has been um, decades of neglect. There has been now a discussion about how do you overcorrect for what was something that was just unfair. You know, I think an abuse of human rights almost, you could put it that way. If women can't go to the field and play or watch a football match, which is the case in some countries in the Middle East and Asia and so on, you know, access, just respect for these women as human beings. And unfortunately for the male dominated industry in which I work, that hasn't always been the case. Women have been suppressed, deliberately held out of positions of administration, coaching, and ultimately playing the game at just a normal level. That's shifting. The big clubs of the world are investing now in clubs. They are in their own teams. Everything has started to turn around. And I think you're starting to see now a lot of plays, even from Australia, benefit from those opportunities to play in different markets that previously weren't taken as seriously. Well, that's it for our Aussies Abroad football special. Don't forget to log on to aussiesabroad.tv where you can sign up and subscribe to our YouTube channel and get the latest updates on all our news, views, interviews and special features like this one. Next week, we're putting together an NFL special where we pay tribute to all Aussies doing things in NFL and college football around the world. Plus, all our Aussies Abroad content is available as a podcast. You can get that wherever you like to listen to your latest pod. Thanks so much for your company. Good luck to Aussies doing amazing things all over the world. We'll catch you next time on Aussies Abroad.